over the past three weeks now, I've been doing a series of teaching entitled, What Hinders Our Spiritual Growth and Freedom in Christ? Okay, there are a lot of things that hinders that. What hinders our spiritual growth and freedom in Christ? Now, if you want to know what they are, you're going to have to go back and watch or listen to part one, part two, and part three of those anointed messages on Facebook or on YouTube. Or if you got a link, you need to go back. I'm telling you, there was some powerful stuff there, and that's why I felt like I needed to do that. Because what I'm recognizing in church is sometimes we can preach a message, and people will get excited, and then that's it. But God said, no, I want you to do more series because I need people. If you're going to talk about faith, I want it to be on their mind, not just one week or two weeks. I want it to be on their mind all the time. And so that's why he's allowed me to have to do all of this. Okay, so just go back and, and listen to those. Okay, now today I'm going to be concluding this series of teaching, and I want to conclude with talking about appetites. Everybody say appetite. Anybody got an appetite for something they would like to eat today? All right, appetites, okay? So I'm going to be concluding about appetites. Everyone say with me, appetite. Okay? And then if you're watching by social media, type appetite. That's all I want you to do is say appetite, okay? So it's important that we understand, okay? So now, what is your appetite like when it comes to spiritual growth and freedom in Christ? What is your appetite like, okay? What is your appetite like when it comes to your spiritual growth and freedom in Christ. Now, I need y'all to listen to me. God created us with an appetite, which is essential for physical survival. No one can survive without food, okay? Is that right? Nobody can survive, survive without food. When we are hungry, what do we do? We eat, or we get down, or we grub, amen? And after some times, we are hungry again, and this what we do. We eat. Some people eat one time a day. Some people eat two times a day. Some people eat three times a day. Some people just eat all day. Amen. They get up in the middle of the night, and they're eating. Amen. So, but they eat again and again, and the cycle goes on. And because this cycle goes on, what? We survive. Do you know what God has also created in our hearts? He given us a hunger or an appetite for spiritual things. He's given us an appetite for spiritual things. And I want to ask you a question. Do you have an appetite for God? Do you have an appetite for God? Do you shop at God's supermarket for your spiritual nourishment? So where are you shopping? when it comes to your spiritual nourishment. That's because our appetites dictate the directions of our lives. Whether it be craving of our stomachs, the passionate desires of possession or power, or the longing of our spirit for God. But for the Christian, the hunger for anything besides God can be an arch enemy. While our hunger for God and him alone is the only thing that will bring us the victory. God wants you to have victory in every aspect of your life. He wants you to have victory. That's because your spiritual condition, but your spiritual condition will always depend on that. Say it again. Your spiritual condition will always depend on that. You see, your hunger for spiritual food of God's word, your hunger for God's presence in your life. Oh, I want the presence of God to be evident in my life. David recognized that when he, he messed up and he says, God, please don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. Samson messed up and he didn't know that the Spirit of God had even left him and he began to do everything in the flesh. And we need to hunger for the presence of God in my life that people can sense the presence of God in our life. 
We need to hunger for a communion with Christ. God, I want to live my every day with you. I don't want a day to go by where I don't mention Jesus or Christ out of my, name, out of my mouth. Amen? We need a hunger for fellowship with the Holy Spirit's presence because the Holy Spirit is a comforter and he, he's, a, he's a guider, he's a protector, he's a warner. Amen? Amen? We need the Holy Spirit's presence and we need a hunger to live for God and for his glory. When I leave this earth, I want to be known that, uh, uh, you know, some people want to be known for a preacher or, or being a millionaire or famous. I want to be known for being a man after God's own heart. That I want to please him. I want to be the apple of his eye. Therefore, I'm asking you again, how far are you going to go with your walk? with him. How far are you going to go? How far are you going to go? Are y'all with me? Because how far you go will determine, will be determined by your hunger to go far and deep in him. Okay? It would be the tongue. How, how, how much of God do you want? How desperate are you for God? How much do you want him? Do you think about him before you go to bed? Do you think about him when you get up in the morning? Do you think about him when you're sleeping at night, even if you have a bad dream, but you call Jesus, Jesus, Jesus? He's always on your mind. How deep do you want to go with him? And how much of God will you use? And how much God will use you in this life will always be determined by your intensity or your hunger to be used by God. Do you want to be used by God? Do you want to be his hand? Do you want to be his feet? Do you want to be his mouthpiece? Do you want to be that chosen generation that is proclaiming his praises? Do you want to be that? You see, the thing is about everything I just said, it's your choice. God's not going to make you do anything. It's your choice. You know, every major decision that I've made, God would always allow me to go to a hotel for two or three days and I take no cell phone, or I, have, I turn my cell phone off, I turn the telephone off, I turn, I, I don't have nothing. And the only thing I do is I go to that room. I go to that room and I stay in that room. And the only thing I do is if God tells me to go to sleep, I'll sleep. And then when he wakes me up, if he wants me to pray two or three hours, I'll pray two or three hours. If he wants me to read, I'll read. And, 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 and those have been some of the best days when I have done that, when I've gotten along with God, God didn't ask me to do it, but I wanted to do it. I needed him. I needed him. I was desperate for him. And this is a day that we've got to be desperate for God. We've got to be desperate for God. And so I declare to you that now is the time to get spiritually hungry. Now is the time to get spiritually hungry. Somebody type that. Hallelujah. Lord, help me to be spiritually hungry. Help me to be spiritually hungry. What did Jesus say about hunger? What did he say about hunger? He said this in Matthew. He said, I want to turn around, but it's not there. But Matthew 5, 6, it says this. Blessed are those who hunger. Okay, you know what that word blessed means? It means happy. Fulfilled. It says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. You ever ate a good meal? Amen. You ever ate a good meal and you was just, you couldn't eat no more? Y'all know what y'all wanted to do, right? After you ate that good meal. Yeah, you want to find a place to sleep. Amen. You want to find, you start yawning. Amen. You got to, oh, y'all got to go now. I'm, I'm full, you know. <laughs> Amen. But he said, you shall be what? Filled. 
Yes, God is the fill in the filling business. In fact, the word fill means to be satisfied in the sense of being stuffed after a scrumptious meal. Amen. Hallelujah. God wants you to live a satisfied life. Let me say it again. God wants you to live, I'm going to take it like this. God wants you to live a happy and fulfilled life. Amen. You see, hunger and thirst are natural expressions of the basic human desires and the need for food and water. We all need food and water. I ask sometimes people, they say, oh, my back is hurting, and this is not the case all the time. And I say, do you, do you drink water? They say, no, I drink sweet tea and soda, and, 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 and I get the system of tea is mixed up with water. I said, no, you got to drink some water. You got to have some water in your system, amen? You just can't go off all of that stuff, amen? You got to just drink what? Water. As a matter of fact, what they tell you should wait, drink what, 40 ounces of water per day? 40 ounces of water today, or, or eight glasses, or what? Five glasses or something, eight ounces, okay? So you should drink water, okay? You should drink water. So that's a basic need. We got to have what? Food, and we got to have water. Now, one of the clear indications that something is wrong physically is when we lose our appetite. You know something is wrong especially if it go on for days. You know something is wrong. You know that you need to call the doctor when you lose your appetite like that. See, a decreased appetite occurs when you have a reduced desire to eat. You just don't want to eat. They can bring you your favorite food. It, it, it's just not appealing to you. You just don't want it. Are y'all with me? It may also be known as a poor appetite or the loss of an appetite. Well, you know what? It's the same spiritually. So many people have lost their appetite. You see, to hunger and thirst for God is at the very root of our being. It's the way God made us. Okay? He made us. Y'all heard this, what is in Revelation. Thou art worthy, thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and praise. Amen. Amen. And we were created for what? His pleasure. We were created for God's pleasure. Okay? You were created for God's pleasure. Come on, somebody type that. You were created for God's pleasure. Okay? You were created for His pleasure. You see... It's the way God made us. When there is no hunger for the presence of God, listen to me, when there's no hunger for the presence of God, it's an indicator that something is wrong with us spiritually. Something is wrong with us spiritually. Because that hunger is so basic to a, the human nature, it often finds fulfillment in other areas rather than seeking God. And see, that's what's wrong with man. Man think that there are a lot of things that's going to help them to be fulfilled in life. Look at Hollywood. These people got all this money. They rich, they famous, they're fortunate. But over half of them, uh, 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 marriage fail. Oh, probably 80%. Amen. Over half of them have to go see a shrink or a therapist. Or have some type of addiction or something like that. Because they're hungering and thirsting for the wrong thing. Are y'all understanding what I'm saying? You see, much as eating unhealthy food can dull your physical appetite. You ever had somebody say, no, you better not eat that because you're going to do what? You're going to spoil your appetite. Okay? And there are some people, we're eating the wrong food, and we are spoiling our spiritual appetite. So that which is not of God can dull our spiritual appetite appetite. This happens to non-Christians as they look for happiness and fulfillment in areas except in their relationship with God. Because when we get depressed or we get sad, what do we start doing? We, we, find, we, we, find, we figure out something that we need to do in order to, you know, to try to make us feel good. Are y'all understand what I'm saying? And so that happens in every area, okay? That happens. 
You see, it may be human relationships. We want to be loved by someone. We don't want to be lonely. You understand? And, and, and we can't wait on God, so we go out and we do something that goes against God. Are y'all with me? It may be your quest for power or money. How many times have people gotten depressed and they have to go and shop till they drop? Come on. Or they think that material things is going to make it, you know, and we get all this stuff, and then when we get all this stuff, we, we like it for a while, and then we have to go back and try to get some more stuff. And then some people, they escape to physical pleasure. You see, the saddest examples, however, are of Christians who allow their appetite for God to be dull by other things. You know, you know, one of the things that will dull our spiritual appetite is religion. We just practice religion. We just go to church. We sing songs. We say the right things. But our lifestyle does not negate where we should be in God. How we live our life. How we live our life when we're in church should be how we live our life outside of church. You see, so many churches are filled with believers who are so satisfied by just activities, programs, and projects that they no longer have a hunger for God. They don't hunger, have a hunger for God. Let's look at a lick of, of spiritual hunger. Okay? Here are a few ways to diagnose your spiritual, to see spirit, your spirit to see if you're hungry. Okay? Let me give you these. Now, I you, you know where you are. I can't judge you. You only know where you are. Here are eight things. Holiness is never on your mind. Okay? Because if holiness was on your mind, you're going to be Christ-like in everything you do. And when you're tempted to do things that you know that you shouldn't be doing, that holiness is going to keep you in line. You see, so holiness is never on your mind. Rather than becoming holy, God said you should. You could. Okay? He said, be ye what? Holy as what? I am holy. Okay? And it ain't about the makeup, the dress. It's about your heart. You concentrate on the world in the place of sanctification. In other words, you're not separating yourself the way that you're supposed to. And sometimes believers can't tell or unbelievers can't tell whether you're one of them or you're a follower of Christ. So you don't set yourself apart from God. Because you're finding yourself being in that arena. And you're not, you're, 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 that's not on your mind like it used to be. Two, other things take precedent over your relationship with God. In other words, you'll commit to different things. you commit to other people. you allow yourself to be influenced by other people. And you know what's right, but you find yourself allowing yourself to let other things take precedent over it. So if you were on your way to church and somebody said, hey, I got this, uh, this, this, this gift certificate I want to give you, and we need to go shopping now. And you got, you're on your way to church, you'd be like, all right, let me text pastor. I'm not going to be there. Because we got to do it now. Come on. Other things are taking precedence. Amen? Are y'all with me? Okay, number three. You aren't hungry, which means your spiritual tank is empty, but you don't see any reason to refill it. You just don't see any reason to refill it. You just, I mean, when it comes to spiritual things, it's just like, wow. Four. You're full of yourself. And you trust your own abilities. Well, there used to be a time where you would, you would pray and you would cry and you would seek God 
And you would say, oh, God, if you don't do it, I don't know how I'm going to do it. God, there's no other way. And you've gotten to a place where you're not acknowledging God like you used to, and you're just handling it on your own. Five, and this is what has happened in the pandemic. Weariness and fatigue has taken over. You're just tired. You're frustrated. Asking God, why? You see, life wears you out because you attempt to carry what Jesus already has. It's not your burden. He said, I already got it, but you got to give it to me. And a lot of times we'll come to the altar and we'll give it to God, but we have this imaginary string on it, and then what happens is we walk away and we let the string go way out, way out, way out. And then when we get out of the presence of God, we pull we reel it back in. To put it another way, your soul feels like it's just above your toes. You just become weary. You're tired. Somebody, y'all feeling me? Number six, it seems like there's an open pit or void distance between you and God. And you know when you you know when there's a sometimes when you when you know that you start getting depressed. You start feeling restless, and you start being anxious about life. And so there just seems to be that void there. Number seven, serving others is way down on your priority list. To be honest, there is no spiritual overflow in your heart, your mind, and spirit. Okay? Without an abundant spirit, you have nothing to give. You feel like, I don't have nothing to give. And so you're saying, hey, I don't want to be bothered with nobody. I don't, I, don't, I don't pray for nobody. I don't want nobody asking me for help or doing anything. When the Bible says each of you should not look toward your own interests, but the interests of others. And as you do unto others, God would have what? People to do unto you. And so right now, your world is about you. It's about you. And then the last one, forgetting how it feels to seek God is a common sign that you have lost your spiritual hunger. You're not praying like you should. You're not reading the Bible like you should. On the positive side, when you feel that way, Long enough, you may find your way back to him. God is longing for you. He hasn't given up on you. He's longing for you, just like he did with the prodigal son. He's longing for you. He's not going to be the one to pursue you. He just wants you to come and pursue him, but he's at a distance and he's looking and he said, I'm just waiting, believing one day my son or my daughter or my child is going to come home and they're going to do whatever needs to be done. Maybe your appetite to spend time with him has lost its edge. When it comes to praying or reading or doing something, you just get bored or tired. You have given way to the pressures of daily living, and now your devotional life, it needs resuscitating. See, there was a time in your past where you were hungry for God and where you are now. You were so hungry. You were so gun ho for God. This is what the psalmist said. He said, one thing I ask from the Lord, this one thing I seek. Okay. 
You, you see, this is one thing. One thing I ask of the Lord, this is one thing I see. What do we, we, we want to seek his presence. We want to seek him. We want to know him. We want to know him. We want to know him. See, I wanted to know God not because my parents uh, 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 brought me up in church or anything. I wanted to know God for myself. You see, you can remember a time when you were hungry for God. You couldn't wait to spend time with him or just to be in his presence. You encountered him more than any other time in your life and yet always desire more of him. You're not sure when or where you drifted from that place in God. And you know what? You can be in church and you can be going through the motion. I remember what I said, that, uh, I quoted a quote from Bishop Bob McLaughlin when he said, you know, some people, you can't expect to get saved the right way and live right. You can't expect to get saved the wrong way and live right. There you go. Thank you, Sister Mickles. I heard you. <laughs> you can't expect to what? What? To li get saved the wrong way and live right. And there are too many people that have been in church all their life. But if you make them mad, oh, God, you would have think Satan came from the pit. You see, all you know is you need to find your way back. See, this is a message of hope. I'm telling you the sign. You need to find your way back. You see, so many Christians today smack their way through the day on junk food activities, and then they find they have no time to feast with God. We complain about our busyness and how tired we are, but that is typically a spiritual problem more than a problem of schedule. We desire everything except God at times. We take God in small doses throughout the day and the week, and somehow we hope that on Sunday we can catch up with our time with the Lord. What has happened to some believers is that their appetite for other things have taken the place of their hunger for God. And in order to understand what I mean, let's look at this, Proverbs chapter 23, verses 1 through 3. I'm almost there, but I'm, I'm giving you this because, you know, God is saying, you got to disciple people. You got too many people that just go to church, but they have not been discipled. They know so little about God's word. They only know the scriptures that they've heard the preacher say. Look what it says here in Proverbs 23, verses 1 through 3. It said, when you sit down to eat with a ruler, consider carefully what is before you. And put a knife to your throat if you are a man given to appetite. Do not desire his delicacies, for they are deceptive food. You see, it was the phrase given to appetite that I want to look at. And so the question is, what is the difference between hunger and appetite? Okay? Somebody type that. What is the difference between hunger and appetite? Let's look at this very briefly. What is the difference between hunger and appetite? You, now, you need to understand this so you will know why and how the prescription works. Now, according to the definition, hunger is the stomach feeling of discomfort caused by a lack of food intake. Okay, so if you hadn't eaten in a long time, what are your stomach going to do? It's going to start growling. Okay? Because it, it's saying, feed me, feed me, feed me. Okay? Now, on the other hand, appetite is a strong desire or a lacking for food or drink whether you're hungry or not. I know when I was growing up, you know, because we didn't have a lot of food, you know, and we would get our food and my mama would say, nobody else can eat anything until they clean everything off their plate. 
And if there was one more pork chop left, guess what? I'm going to eat fast. Amen. Amen. And then have your stomach ever gotten bigger than, or your eyes got bigger than your stomach? Amen. You saw all these people in the house, and you saw the amount of food you had, and you're like, oh, my Lord. Hello? Y'all understand what I'm talking about? Come on, be honest now. Amen. Amen. So sometimes we'll put what? More on our plate than we know we can handle. Amen? So appetite is a strong desire or liking for food or drink, whether you're hungry or you just want it. See, appetite is a God-given gift when used the way he intended, to satisfy the body's need for food. However, your appetite is out of control if you are eating often when your body is not physically hungry. You can find yourself eating whenever the opportunity presents itself, such as from emotional hunger, or you're just bored. You, ever, you, ever, you know, you've been sitting on the couch, and you were just bored, and you say, I'm just, I just want something. My wife tells me that all the time. She say, you just got through eating. You just got through eating. And I go in there and get me a big bag, you know, of chips or of cheese puffs or you know, I want some ice cream or something. She said, you just, you won't even let your food settle down. You just got through eating. Come on, I'm not the only one. Amen. Or we just eat because simply the food is there. We just eat it because it's there. Amen? That's something. You see, failure to control your appetite is the same as failing to control an undisciplined child who throws a tantrum when he or she doesn't get their way. Let's look at the scriptures which speaks to developing this hunger. I'm going to give you these scriptures. You can write them down. I'm just going to say them and give you these scriptures. Okay? Remember, I, I, I prepared the food. You just got to want it or not. Matthew 5, 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. John 4, 14, Whoever drinks the water I give you, you will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give you, you will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. John 6, 35. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and who believes in me will never be thirsty. John chapter 7, verses 37 through 38. On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures have said, streams of living water will flow from within him. Isaiah 55, verses 1 through 2. Come, all who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come and buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor and what does not satisfy. Psalm 63, 1. Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you. In a dry and weary land where there is no water. Revelations 22, verse 17. The spirit and the bride says come. And let him who hears say come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come. Whoever wishes, let him take free of the gift of the water of life. Now, it is obvious that the imagery of hungering and thirsting after God is a scriptural concept. It's a scriptural concept. You see, from the prophets of the Old Testament to Jesus and through the books of Revelation, the people of God are always depicted as those who develop a desire for God. Can you imagine that you're in the presence of God for 40 days and 40 nights. I'm not talking about Jesus. I'm talking about Moses. And on the mountain. And Moses says to God, show me your glory. And God was touched by that. And God let Moses know, you know, no man has ever seen my face and lived. He says, but because you want to see my glory, I'm going to show you my glory. 
He said, so when I pass by, I'm going to pass by. And when I pass by, I'm going to put you in the cleft of the rocks because if you saw everything, that you would be just annihilated. But I'm going to put you in the, in, in the cleft of the rock. And when, you pass, when I pass by, I'm going to cover it. And then when I get by, I'm going to let you see my backside. And when Moses came down from the mountain, People know that he had been in the presence of God because his face shone for, for hours upon hours that they could not look at Moses in the face because he got the backside of God. Amen. They could not see his face, so they had to put a veil on Moses' face. Could it be that what's the missing element in the church today is that the desire for God himself? Ben Patterson writes, he says, since the best teacher of prayer is the Holy Spirit, the best way to learn to pray is by praying. Just do it. Whether and how much we pray is, I think, finally a matter of appetite. See, everybody not like me. You can't spend night all night in prayer like or you can't spend three. I don't want, I don't want you to be like me. Because everybody's appetite is different. I think finally, a matter of appetite or hunger for God is all that he desires. He just wants you. He wants you. He wants you. He wants you. How do I know? Why would he go through all the changes of sending his son? Because he wants you. C.S. Lewis wrote in his Weight of Glory, we are far too easily pleased that in the end, in the reason we do not pray more than we do, nothing less than infinite joy is offered us in God's kingdom of light. He has promised that he will one day shine like the sun in that kingdom. So we have to become satisfied. We have become satisfied with mere church. Just doing church and religious activities. See, there's nothing wrong with these things, but there's more than foam left by the surf of the ocean of God's glory. There will always be a pause in your growth and your development, but the key question is, what is stopping you from restarting? And let me, let me get through this last part, and I'm, I'm done. See, God wants to equip you with the skills that you need to begin these habits. See, in order to grow, we need to eat. Let me say it again. In order to grow, you need to eat the Bible. In order to grow, you need to eat the Bible. In order to grow, we need to breathe prayer. No, I want to say that again. In order to grow, we need to breathe prayer. In order to grow, we need good spiritual hygiene. Okay, what, 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 when, you, when, you, when you have bad hygiene, that's because you don't wash up. Come on. You get around people and they're like, oh, Lord. Okay. We need good spiritual hygiene. And you know what good spiritual hygiene is? It's when we're confessing our sins. We're saying, God, I messed up. Please forgive me. If you give me another chance, I'm not going to come to you with the same thing. But you forgive me. We need to confess. In order to grow, we need to care for caring family. We need fellowship. No man is an island unto himself. Now, I didn't say that was a scripture. Okay? I said, no man is an island to himself. Two are better than one. I, I, let me say this. As a pastor, I need you. I need you. Okay? And you need me. We need one another. We are better together. You know, as I said, when a lion attacks, he always looks for what? The weakest link. And he tries to separate them from the pack. And if, if he can, he'll separate you. 
Can, can I say this? I heard this last night. Um, um, what's his name that you be listening to all the time? Don Hanna out of Chicago. He said this. I want to make sure I get it right. When Saul persecuted the church, he persecuted the Christians, right? He threw them in jail. He had them, uh, uh, um, um, uh, uh, you know, um, he just, he, he, you know, when, when Stephen died, he, he, okay, so he persecuted Christians, okay? Okay, now, Saul is on the road to Damascus, okay? And he's going to what? Persecute Christians. Okay, now watch this. He's going to persecute what? Christians, right? Watch this. He's going to persecute Christians, right? Okay, now watch this. When, when Jesus knocked him off his horse, Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He said, who are you? He said, I'm Jesus. Now, why, why, why didn't he say, why are you persecuting my people? He said, no, you're persecuting me. So I'm, I'm going to give somebody something. Every time you criticize the church, okay, every time you criticize God's people, you are persecuting Jesus. Because the church is his bride. So every time you remember that, now you go back and look at it. Okay? But Saul was persecuting God's people. And he said, why are you persecuting me? And so people need to understand that because we take the church lightly. Okay? I, I, I look at it like this. Roosevelt taught me a very valuable lesson. One day, we was over at his house, and he had this dog, and he was just talking about, look, that dog ain't no good for nothing. He lazy. That's all he do. He want to eat. And then, so I started getting into it. I said, yeah, he is a lazy old dog. I get him over there. Roll the bell, stop me. He said, hey, that's my dog. You can, I, I can talk about him, but you ain't going to talk about him. I said, ooh, okay. <laughs> I thought that was a good analogy. Guess what? Okay? No church is perfect. And you may have problems within the church. But don't, don't let nobody else talk about your family. Don't let nobody else criticize your family. Yeah. Amen? Let, let, me, let me wrap this up. We, in order to grow, you need to regularly exercise church service. In order to grow, we need protection from temptation. In order to grow, we need to give stewardship of our finances. And this is my closing statement. This is my closing statement. When I found this, I was like, God, this is the right statement. Listen to this. Listen to this. A young student went to his rabbi, and he asked a question. Master, how can I truly find God? Okay, somebody say, how can I truly find God? T text that. How can I truly find God? Okay. The rabbi asked the student to accompany him to the river, which ran by the village, and invited him to go into the water. When they got to the middle of the stream, the rabbi said, please immerse yourself in the water. The student did as he was instructed. Whereupon, the rabbi put his hand on the young man's head, and he held him under the water. I mean, he just held him. Presently, the student began to struggle because he was gasping. The rabbi held him under still longer. He would not let him go. He would not let him go. The rabbi held him on still longer. A moment passed, and the student was thrashing it and beating the water in the air with his arms. Still, the rabbi held him under the water. Finally, the student was released and shot up from the water. His lungs was aching, and he was grasping for air. The rabbi waited for a few moments and then said, in 
you desire God as truly as you desire to breathe the air you just breathe, then you shall find. How much do we want God? How much do we want God? I just want you. Is that your desire sometimes? I've had days where I, I just need a break. It's all right to take a break. But don't let that be a habit. But we should always just want should just want him. I just want you, God. I want you more than anything. I want you. Are you one that got saved the wrong way? Trying to live right? See, your lifestyle would tell on you. And I hear people all the time say, don't judge me. You go, look up, you go look up that text, you're using it out of context. You're using that scripture out of context when you say, don't judge. The Bible said, don't, 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 be, don't, what? don't judge me. But that's what, what you, you, you say. You better go look up the text and say, what is the meaning of that? I, you know what? I just want you to want God just like I want him. Let's stand.